change gears now to your cricketing career, which is obviously what a lot of people want to hear about. And it's a stellar one. I don't have to tell anybody that. I mean, four World Cup titles in both formats of the 50 and 20 over game, uh, double figure uh, WNCL titles, five consecutive ones, the first lady ever to get to the all rounders double of 100 and 1,000, uh, 100 wickets and 1,000 runs and doing it at Lords. Uh, just just to boot. Uh, did you actually think when you began that this was the ki- these were the kind of dizzying heights that you would uh, potentially be able to reach or wanted or aspired to and planned for in terms of how you prepared and how you went about your game? I think for me and personally, it was never about what's the final number. <laughs> Mm. that I want to get to. It was never about individual statistics. And to be, and I'll give you a prime example, this, the double of the hundred and the uh, thousand runs and a hundred wickets. I had no idea until I think last month when someone tweeted that I got it at really? Lord's. I actually didn't know where it was. So that just shows you women's cricket back then and stats. There was no big screen. There was no crowds. There was no cheering. Well done, Lisa. You're the first. There was nothing of that, that kind. Um, so, so for me, what, what motivated me was I wanted to play the game of cricket and I wanted the team to be successful. And I was very fortunate to be part of, you know, certain generations that dominated not only international cricket, but also from a, a domestic point of view as well. So um, what motivated me was world titles, was WNCL domestic titles, um, And that I played a role with the bat and ball. Now, looking back at my career, you know, after it's passed, I guess there's a part of me that's disappointed I didn't go on with those 60s, 70s scores and turn them into big hundreds. Because for me, I was all, I felt that I was a batting all rounder. But if you look at my stats, you'll go, oh, you look at the numbers, she's a bowling all rounder. And I got into the Australian team and the New South Wales team because they needed a spinner. But I was an opening bat in all of my junior cricket. I opened the batting for Australia. When I first debuted for Australia, I batted at 11. Three years later, I think I was opening with Belinda Clark. And then I finally slotted down to three, four. And then I think right at the end, I went back to to five um, in the one-day team. So, um, yeah, I've always seen myself as a batting all-rounder. But uh, for me, like I said, it was all about winning titles. And I was fortunate enough to win plenty of them as well. Certainly you have. Uh, Hearing and reading about some of the adjectives that your teammates, both at New South Wales and Australia, have used for you, uh, seems to be a very interesting uh, sort of mix of them. So I'm going to throw a couple at you and see uh, if you will help us understand how you balance the two. I mean, there's something uh, uh, something that someone said, which is, oh, she's as silly as the youngest person in the team. Uh, she's, uh, She's a prankster. And then the, the one common refrain that comes out, wow, she is competitive beyond recognition. Do not get on the wrong side. Uh, how does this sort of easygoing, fun-loving aspect of pranks and you know, being silly and all of that <laughs> uh, balance itself with this really classic Aussie, got to win, got to do this, make it happen approach? How does that balance itself? Yeah, I'd probably say later on in my career, the more prankster, silly side of me came out. Um, And I think the silly side, the people that would have said it were Elisa Healy and Elise Perry, because we were the three little monkeys at the back of the bus that just kind of, we kind of, um, we'd have our own little little group where we do stupid things and uh, and sometimes everyone else and we felt everyone else was so serious like I think there needs to always be a balance in a, in a team environment yes you need your serious players to drive what you're trying to do but also you need to have fun along the way because certainly back then we weren't getting paid we were playing because we wanted to yeah. so if we're going to give up that much time of our life to the sport let it at least be fun that's what I used to say um, but certainly uh, as soon as I got into a game, as soon as I crossed the line, um, I had been taught, and you know, this is where probably the New South Wales senior players, Linda Clark, Lisa Kitely, even our coach, Steve Jenkins, there were little things that um, enabled us to be so professional 
in everything that we did it, apart from getting money as a professional athlete. Like for instance, we would we were never allowed to wear thongs in our in our training uniform or playing uniform. Whereas you see guys now they walk around after the game with thongs because they want to air out their feet. For us, it was you look the part. If you're going to wear this uniform, wear it with pride and look the part. So little things like that were instilled in me at a, a re, at a really young age. And I guess from there, I also taught when I played with them. When you cross that line, you're there to win a game of cricket. How you win it is up to you. Um, be fair, but be really hard and be ruthless. And don't let people, don't give them a sniff. So my competitive um, streak, I probably owe it to my father, actually, because he's also a Leo. Um, and every time we play table tennis um, or any kind of game, snooker, backyard <laughs> cricket, it was like we both wanted to win. Um, and and that was kind of instilled in me very at a very young age as well. So even in training, I would muck around and have fun. But then when it was my turn to bowl or bat or something like that, it would be game on. The game the game face would come on. But the great thing about cricket is you're on for what 10, 15 seconds when the bowler starts running up, and then you've got another probably 45 seconds as they make their. So you don't need to be that serious all the time. I think if you are that serious. You're going to burn yourself out in cricket, so you've got to have a bit of fun along the way. Always, always room for for easing the tension. Uh, while we are at cricket and talking about cricket, uh, in the era when when you played the bulk of your cricket, even though other countries, India in particular, was coming up, it seemed to us from the outside that it was still very much a England, Australia, New Zealand kind of. Uh, at the top of the game, how do you how do you build that that culture? I know you've been in leadership positions. You're part of the association. In fact, the first lady to be part of the players' association. You do a lot of coaching work. We'll talk about some of your philanthropic uh, aspects in just a moment. But how do you personally, along with your colleagues who may be like-minded, look to drive this through in the countries where it's not so popular and places like India where it's it's a crazy love. But somehow there still is something missing. What is that? As for India, um, I, I believe it, it is the most untapped market um, when, when it comes to the women's game. And you know, I've been fortunate enough to do some work with Rajasthan Royals and gone out to schools and um, I've had a look, just more, probably more so in Rajasthan. What's the pathway for a, you know, a twelve-year-old girl if she loves the game of cricket? Where does she go? And it's not really a systematic pathway. Yes, there is in Mumbai, Bengaluru, Delhi, um, probably Chennai as well. Um, but there isn't for those smaller villages. And you look at even the Indian women's side at the moment, a lot of them come from the villages, smaller towns outside of the main cities, and, and they somehow find their way. But what if there was a proper pathway, a process um, that could pick up talent along the way? But also, India as a nation just loves the game of cricket, yet there are, there are thousands of opportunities for young boys to play it. There isn't that many for girls. So, um, you know, my, part of my work with Rajasthan Royals is to create more opportunities for young girls. So if they love the game and want to play it, they can. Um, and they don't have to play it against boys if they don't want to. If they're good enough and they want to compete, I have no hesitation in saying, go for it, keep playing with the boys because it will certainly um, test your skills out. But, but certainly uh, India, if they start to, to put some processes and pathways all the way down in more of a grassroots area, they certainly got it from, um, you know, state competitions, you know, your under 19s and potentially there's talks about an under 16 competition. If you go even further down, if you get that sorted, well, wow. you talk about a bucket full of people and then you only have to pluck out a few more. You're going to have some very talented cricketers coming through. Well, I'm sure that people, people in the know at the BCCI will, will, will have taken notice if they haven't already. Uh, yes, there's been a journey uh, and there's a lot more that needs to and hopefully will be done. Let's move, just given the interest of time, Lisa, uh, to the aspect of you moving from on-field exploits to sort of getting into the commentary box, whether it is radio or television. And uh, as you made that transition, in some cases, you would have been talking about uh, former teammates. Uh, 
Uh, and then, of course, yeah. as time goes along, you're looking at other people. Now, there are different views of different people about how uh, the transition is made. There's no question that, that people who've played the game at your level understand it and understand its nuances and so on and so forth. What is it that led you to go into commentary? Was it again something that you planned? Is it something that happened by accident? And did you have to sort of mentally think differently when you were talking about the game to viewers and listeners? So my first exposure in the commentary box was 2010. I was still playing at the time. Elise Perry and I were given the opportunity. They flew us up to Brisbane. Um, part of the Channel 9 coverage and it was the ACA All-Stars versus the Australian team. And it's mm. actually the game that Tim Payne broke his finger um, and obviously was the one that caused him, like we, he disappeared off the face of the earth for the, the next kind of five years. Um, but I was given five overs. I sat between Tony Gregg and Mark Nicholas um, and I sat down. They, put, they didn't have the director in my ear, but I put an earpiece in. And I just, I just sat down and I looked around and I was like, okay, I'm sitting next to like a legend. Um, Mark Nicholas is obviously, you know, a supreme professional when it comes to broadcasting. And I looked down and I'm like, this is a pretty good view of the ground. I'm right behind the bowler. You can see everything here. And then I've got all the stats in front of me, different screens. And the five overs went like that. And I, that kind of, I went, oh, this is cool. How do I do this job? <laughs> How do I get into this when I finish playing? Um, and that was that was when I realised I wanted to do that. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, there aren't any females talking about cricket. Why is that? Like, we play the game. Lots of females watch the game. Why don't we have a female? Um, so that's when I started to kind of probably hang around the Channel 9 box a fair bit. Um, every time there was a test at the SCG or One Day International, I was working at Cricket New South Wales, so I had a pass that could get me anywhere. So I'd just go up and say good day to the guys and then I'd stick around and watch, see how it all worked. Um, so I, I, that's probably the first time where I went, okay, great, this is what I want to do. So I started to pick up and learn and... Obviously, when you start, and you would know as well, that when you watch and listen to a game of cricket, you sometimes just focus on the commentary now. So if that's what your interest is, you, yes, you watch the game, but you listen, How? what do they say? When do they say it? Why do they say it? Um, and then I got my, my real chance to, to commentate, um, again, right at the end of my career, ABC Grandstand um, started to cover the Big Bash and they said, Lisa, would you be interested? And I said, well, yeah, I, I've never done it. <laughs> How do you do it? Um, but let's see it. And they said, yeah, let's see if you feel comfortable doing that. So that was probably my first opportunity. And I loved it. I loved it straight away. And so ABC Grandstand started to get me more involved. And when I did retire uh, in 2000, early 2013, the next summer, I did more ABC Grandstand work. Um, Channel 9 got me back in to cover the women's matches, which again was really cool, just sitting there and talking about the game. Um, and then 2015 was the moment that changed my life when um, some random guy got my number off the ABC grandstand executive producer and said, look, hi, my name's Simon or Terry. I, I'm a player manager and a commentator manager. Would you like to do the IPL? And I was like, yeah, sure, mate. Like, yeah, in 10 years' time. <laughs> but that's kind of, that's the end goal, really. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, well, I, I hear they're thinking about having females. Would you like me to make some inquiries for you? I said, yeah, go for it. Like, no harm in asking. And then he rings up two weeks. He goes, yep, you're in. And I'm like, sorry? I'm in. He goes, yeah, yeah. So I went in to Eden Gardens, my first game, with Danny Morrison and Tommy Mbangwa. I had Simon Wheeler, who's like the best director in world cricket, um, for those that understand that, has been involved in, in the industry for so long. He was my director. And Eden Garden is 70,000 people screaming. And I'm like, okay, don't stuff up, Lisa. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And that's the thing. You didn't know what you were doing and you just got thrown in and, and it's all about having people beside you that are willing to spend a bit of time to help you through. And, 
thankfully I did that. But that was my journey into the commentary box. Almost sounds as fascinating as, as the one uh, on the field in its own way. That, that's going to bring me, Lisa, to a point which is often debated. And, you know, people like me in our own little way, uh, but several of us. Players who've played the game at the highest level, uh, their sort of exclusive preserve, if you will, to be in television and radio commentary boxes and aligned to it, uh, a topic that I know is close to your heart about men commentating on the women's game and more importantly, vice versa. Do you have a point of view about the necessity or otherwise of people who are going to be commentating on radio or TV to have necessarily played the game at the international level? Uh, what do you think about that? And when you come in as an international player, have you seen people who have not played the game at that level? And are they accepted into the fraternity uh, the same way? Yeah, well, on your point about do you have to have played the game at an international level to, to understand the game? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's important in a commentary box that uh, you have a variety of different people. Um, you just look at an, into a commentary box, a very good executive producer will have different personalities or people with different skill sets as well. One's a bowler, one's a captain, one's a batter, one's a fast bowler, one's a spinner. And they provide that. It's just like building a normal cricket team. You need to have all walks of life. So along those lines, again, you need to be able to have people that sometimes haven't played the game, but probably have studied it a hell of a lot more than me. So someone like Ahasha Bogle knows so much about the game and the history of the game than I do. But he doesn't know what it's like to be out there on the field, but he provides that other aspect. Um, so I, I don't think you should only have people that have played the game. Like sometimes, I'll give you a prime example. Sometimes after a game of cricket when I was younger, I'd ask my mum what she thought, what she saw. Mm -hmm. she, has no, she had no idea about cricket, the technical aspects or anything like that. But she could see probably the behavioural things. Oh, mm. well, you seemed a bit flat. Like everyone wasn't talking very much. Or was there a fight going on? Out, you know, mums would pick that stuff up. But the cricketer would go, oh, well, you know, you, you didn't back up enough. There wasn't enough movement in the field or someone bowled the wrong line. So I think it's important to get information from a vast group of people that come from different backgrounds. And then you listen to, you. then you've got to think of who's listening or who's watching the telecast. And it's not just the cricket tragedies. No. It is people that just love the game. Now, some may never even know what the rules are. Like the terminology that we have in cricket is ridiculous. How is anyone ever supposed to pick it up? It's like it takes you decades to figure it all out. But so that's why I think it's important to have so many different people. Um, in terms of in terms of what I've seen in the commentary box, well, firstly, being a female and coming into a male-dominated industry, um, I never felt uh, that they didn't want me there. Um, I had a very welcoming group of commentators and still do. Every commentary box that I go into, um, there is an element of, okay, yep, I'm the only girl. <laughs> Predominantly, I'm the only girl, right? Um, there's always a bit of banter. If you can kind of banter with the boys, then you're on side and let's just get on with it. Um, but I think they want to know, can you do the job? Can you, can you see the game? Are you willing to stand by what you say? Have you got convictions to say what you see? If you do that, which is what you're paid to do, yeah. then it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, I say carry on. Um, from, from my point of view, especially with the women's games now, obviously there's a lot more females within the commentary box. Um, but there is a sense of, let me help you out because you're part of my team. So if you, don't, if you aren't good, the coverage isn't good. So um, there is a, I feel like I, even though I've left the team environment from playing on the field, we've created a team environment off the field. And, and that's something that obviously um, is something that I'm really passionate about and something that I love to be involved in.